So we know the ventral body cavity is broken down into the thoracic cavity and the abdominal pelvic cavity. Furthermore, the thoracic cavity, we find the pleural cavity that surrounds the lung and the pericardial cavity that surrounds the heart. We also have a central region within the thoracic cavity referred to as the mediastinum. So this should all be reviewed. Now, one last thing I also want to review is this a general scheme. So we have our organ and the visceral serous membrane and the parietal serous membrane together gives us the serous membrane. We have the serous cavity that's in between the visceral and the parietal serous membrane and filled with serous fluid. And furthermore, we know that the serous membrane is made up of simple squamous epithelium referred to as meso. So let's look at the thoracic cavity first, and then we're going to follow that up by looking at the abdominal pelvic cavity. So the serous membrane that surrounds a pleural cavity is referred to as the pleura. So this is obviously associated with the lung. Okay. So what we're doing now is we're identifying the organ, and we're now identifying the serous membrane. We're actually giving names to these serous membranes. So it's following this general scheme that I just went over and that we discussed in the previous slide as well. So the serous membrane that is associated with the lung, that encloses the lung, that surrounds a pleural cavity, is referred to as the pleura. We also know that the serous membrane, we have the visceral serous membrane and the parietal serous membrane. Therefore, we have the visceral pleura and the parietal pleura. And I even wrote it down over here. And then again, the whole purpose of doing this is to make it crystal clear. So we have the pleura, once again, which is the serous membrane associated with the lungs. Here's your visceral pleura, and here's your parietal pleura. So at the end of the day, ladies and gentlemen, the visceral pleura is an example of the visceral serous membrane. The parietal pleura is an example of the parietal serous membrane. We're now giving specific names to this general scheme that I illustrated to the left. Well, we also know that within the thoracic cavity, we have the pericardial cavity. And of course, that's the heart. So let's go ahead and write that down. So heart. So what we're now saying is that the serous membrane that surrounds the pericardial cavity, that surrounds the heart, is referred to as the pericardium. And of course, we have the visceral pericardium and the parietal pericardium. So another illustration that I made over here. So here is, once again, my pericardium. So please note, the pericardium is the serous membrane that's associated with the heart. Here we have the visceral pericardium and the parietal pericardium. So therefore, the visceral pericardium is another example of a visceral serous membrane, while the parietal pericardium is another example of the parietal serous membrane. So this goes back to this general scheme that I illustrated to the left. If you memorize this general scheme, this will save you a lot of headaches and a potential confusion as well. So all we're doing is identifying the organ, and we're also identifying the serous membrane, the visceral serous, and the parietal serous, as well as the cavity itself. So before we move on to the next slide, I just once again want to point out the mediastinum, the central region, and of course, within the mediastinum, we can't forget, we have the pericardial cavity. Now, let's look at the diaphragm. So this diaphragm, folks, is that sheet of skeletal muscle that we know divides the thoracic cavity from the abdominal pelvic cavity. So can we say that the thoracic cavity is superior to the diaphragm? If you answered yes, then you are correct. Well, can we say that the abdominal pelvic cavity is inferior to this diaphragm, the sheet of skeletal muscle? Yes. Can we say that the thoracic cavity is superior to the abdominal pelvic cavity? Sure we can. What about abdominal pelvic cavity? Is that inferior to the thoracic cavity? Yes. So this is just essentially a horizontal section or a transverse section through the thoracic cavity. So you can see the heart the pericardial cavity, and as well as the pleural cavity that surrounds the lungs. Now, speaking of the lung, please note that we have two lungs. So naturally, we're going to have two pleural cavities, one pleural cavity for 
the right lung and one pleural cavity for the left lung. So in this slide, I've made some drawings of the lungs and the heart. All right, so we have the two lungs and we just discuss that the serous membrane that's associated with the lungs is the pleura. Now take note of the visceral pleura. The visceral pleura is directly attached to the surface of the lung. Now the parietal pleura is what surrounds the wall of the pleural cavity. Speaking of the pleural cavity, that's the space that we find between the visceral and the parietal pleura. Now, what do we find inside of it? Well, we find pleural fluid. The fact that we have two lungs, I mentioned before, we're going to have two pleural cavities. So, pleura is the singular form. Plori is the plural form. So, if you're asked, what are the serous membranes that are associated with the lungs? Then your answer is plori. Why? Because we have two lungs. So, let's now look at the heart. So the serous membrane that surrounds the cavity, that surrounds the heart, is the pericardium. The visceral pericardium is directly attached to the surface of the heart. It directly covers the surface of the heart, while the parietal pericardium surrounds the wall of the pericardial cavity. So the pericardial cavity is the space between the visceral and the parietal pericardium. So the pericardial cavity is filled with the pericardial fluid. Now remember, the pleural fluid and the pericardial fluid are produced by the serous membranes, the pleura and the pericardium. So here's a little activity that I'd like you to identify particular structures that I highlight or I point to. So let's begin with the heart. So this structure that I'm highlighting in green, if you can identify what this is, so this area once again that I'm highlighting in green, what do you think that is? Remember, it's adhered to the surface of the heart. If you answered visceral pericardium, you are correct. All right, what about this one? What do we call this structure? This time, I'll highlight it in blue, all right? So I'm highlighting this structure in blue. So what possibly could this be? Well, if you answered parietal pericardium, then you are correct. All right, what about this area that I'm going to highlight in yellow? So what do we call this area that I'm highlighting in yellow? Well, if you answered pericardial cavity, you are correct. And of course, the pericardial cavity is filled with pericardial fluid. So what do we call the structure that's highlighted in green and highlighted in blue that encloses the area that it's highlighted in yellow? Well, if you answered pericardium, you are correct. So the pericardium, once again, is the serous membrane that surrounds the heart and that forms the pericardial cavity. All right, let's now do the lungs. All right, so I'll highlight in green. I'm not going to do it all the way around, so this should be enough. So what structure is that? Well, if you answered visceral pleura, you are correct. All right, what about the area that I'll highlight in blue? So what do we call that? I'm not, once again, drawing, highlighting the whole region. So what should that be? Well, if you answered parietal pleura, you are correct. Okay, then once again, how about the area that's highlighted in yellow? If you answered pleural cavity, you are correct. And of course, what is that filled with? Pleural fluid. So what do we call the region that it's highlighted in green and highlighted in blue? If you answered pleura, you are correct. That's a serous membrane that encloses the lung and forms the pleural cavity. Let's now discuss the abdominal pelvic cavity, which of course is part of the ventral body cavity, and this is the cavity that lies inferior to the diaphragm. So the abdominal pelvic cavity, we have the abdominal cavity and we have the pelvic cavity. The serous membrane that surrounds or forms a cavity called the peritoneal cavity is called the peritoneum. 
and the part of the peritoneum that is attached to the surface of these abdominal pelvic organs is referred to as the visceral peritoneum, while the parietal peritoneum is the part of the peritoneum that forms the wall of the peritoneal cavity. So I made an illustration to the right. So I illustrated the abdominal pelvic cavity and the visceral peritoneum, once again, is attached to the surface of these abdominal pelvic organs, while the parietal peritoneum is what is attached to the wall of the peritoneal cavity. And taken together, they are part of the peritoneum, which again is the serous membrane. And the cavity is referred to as the peritoneal cavity, and the fluid that we find in this peritoneal cavity is the peritoneal fluid. Now we have what's called retroperitoneal and infraperitoneal. What is retroperitoneal? Retroperitoneal means organs that are found at the back or behind the peritoneum. So retro just basically means the back of the peritoneum. So we'll stick to organs that you had to identify in lab. So we have the pancreas and we have the kidneys. So these organs are said to be retroperitoneal because they lie behind the peritoneum. Then we have what's called infraperitoneal. So infra means below. So therefore, infraperitoneal means below the peritoneum. And sticking to the organs that you id in lab, so an organ that's a good example of being infraperitoneal is the urinary bladder. Now please note, these are not the only organs that are retroperitoneal or infraperitoneal. But once again, I'm only sticking to the organs that you know its location because you had to identify this in lab. So here's the sagittal section that shows us the various organs found in the abdominal pelvic cavity. So please remember that we still have the clenched fist pushing up against a balloon analogy. So we have various structures shown in this particular image, structures that I am not expecting you to memorize. So you're not going to have an image of this, for example, on the exam, and I'm not going to ask you to show me where the greater omentum is or the mesentery proper. These are structures that you're going to have to identify later on in 224 when you cover the digestive system. The last thing I want to discuss before we move on to the next slide is Itis. So we're looking at what I wrote on the left-hand side. So when a word ends with itis, this usually means inflammation of. So examples would be pericarditis. So pericarditis is inflammation of the pericardium that, of course, is associated with the heart. Peritonitis is inflammation of the peritoneum while pleuritis is inflammation of the pleura. Incidentally, pleuritis can also be referred to as pleurisy. So whether you call it pleuritis or pleurisy, it means the same thing, inflammation of the pleura, which of course is associated with the lung. So what ends up happening with pericarditis, peritonitis, or pleuritis, also called pleurisy, is that the serous fluid are displaced. In other words, they're pushed aside. So imagine that we have peritonitis. So we're going to refer to this diagram that I made to the right. So when we have the inflammation of the visceral peritoneum and the parietal peritoneum, then the pleural fluid has no place to go because they're pushed aside. So the result is, is as these abdominal pelvic organs begin to move, which they will, these membranes will rub up against each other. And the result is pain. Now remember, these organs will not stop moving. So therefore, friction will always occur until peritonitis is resolved. The same thing will happen with pericarditis. So with pericarditis, both the visceral and parietal pericardium will inflame. So now what's going to happen to the pericardial fluid? Well, they'll get pushed aside. So therefore, each time the heart beats, both the visceral and the parietal pericardium will rub up against each other. So you can just imagine how painful that is. The same thing will happen with pleuritis, which is also referred to as pleurisy. So once again, we'll have inflammation of the visceral and the parietal pleura. 
So each time we breathe, these membranes will rub up against each other. There will be friction. So as a result, there will be pain with every single breath that the individual takes. 